All right. Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we begin our new week, we will now open the word of God to Judges 11. Shall we seek our Heavenly Father's guidance and blessing and look to understand that which is presented before us and its implications for this time? Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity we have to join together today. We thank you, Father, for this lesson that is now before us. As we come before you, there are many requests, many items that are on the hearts of those that are here assembled. Help us now, Father. Direct us, be with these, especially with the concerns that many have had. Please direct us now. Help us so that our minds may be open and that we may be able to receive your word. May your spirit be with us. May your angels attend us. May we be malleable and willing to accept the examples that are soon to be shown so that we may more properly give the message that you would have us to give. Direct us in this. Be with us, we ask. For this, we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Now, as we are proceeding forward, we've now come to Judges chapter 11. We're going to get into one of the stranger stories in the books of Judges. Jephthah, the son of Gilead, by a strange woman, is thrust out from home by his brethren. At the breaking out of the war, the elders of Gilead sue to him to command them and covenant to make him their head. His embassy to the king of Ammon, which proveth fruitless, his vow, he overcometh the Ammonites, his daughter cometh forth to meet him, with whom he doeth according to his vow. Now that's the overview that the translators would have had of this book. So, Judges 11.1. 1. Now, Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty man of valor, and he was the son of an harlot. And Gilead begat Jephthah. Okay, so, so one point here. So we remember uh, on Thursday we noted that verse 17 and 18 have that paragraph marking. Right. And, and that uh, 11 verse 1 is um, uh, going to be uh, just really a continuation of that. Correct. Now, I do want to note, note something about 11.1. Because uh, uh, we're looking at a date, uh, January 11th, 2023. Right. And is it possible that this relates to that date? Okay. How would we see that? I don't know. Because it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> but it's, it's the end of this prediction, of the chronology of the Trump prediction. And I'm wondering maybe if this has something to do with events that are going to happen um, at that period of time. Okay. But, but um, we do know that this first part is going to uh, look back retrospectively. It's going to give you the background on who Jephthah is. So, uh, but anyway, I just note the 11 1. It just. It, it's going to be interesting because we're looking at this to see what symbols we can glean. Mm -hmm. Also, you know, what, what kind of a metaphor is Jephthah going to be for what we're experiencing now? 
Yeah. It's it's intriguing because as I as I have looked at other portions of scriptures, whenever they use this phrase, the son of an harlot, the alternate Hebrew is a woman, a harlot. Why, why do you think that is? Why, why do they interpret the word? Um, like, why is it a woman, a harlot? Well, uh, I mean, why does I, it put, put those, it, because it's going to use the word Isha, woman, and then it's going to use the word zina, which is basically a wanton woman, is, is how it should literally be translated. Okay. So here is his father, Gilead. Gilead apparently is married, but he has his son, Jephthah, by this wanton woman. Mm -hmm. Now, um, Angela noted, which we noted last time, uh, uh, Hebrews eleven thirty two, okay. speaks of Jephthah. So he's he's listed there in the faith chapter in Hebrews. Right. So. <clears throat> As this, as this section continues, and Gilead's wife bare him sons, and his wife's sons grew up, and they thrust out Jephthah, and they said unto him, Thou shalt not inherit in our father's house, for thou art the son of a strange woman. Three different ways this woman is being described. A woman and harlot. And now a strange woman. In the Hebrew, what is a strange woman? Well, uh, it, it means, um, well, literally, properly hinder in the sense of behind or generally next, other, um, following. So it's often translated as strange, especially in connection with women or wives. Okay. So we have accepted that a woman as a symbol is a church. Is it possible that this is using a metaphor that the strange woman would be akin to the movement? Okay, so um, so we have Jephthah's a Gileadite, a Gileadite, right? Correct, son and, of Gilead. Yeah, so we know that Gilead, of course, is the name of an area as well as a person, right? Okay, agreed. So, I mean, what would Gilead represent? So when it says he's a Gileadite, um, and also he's the son of a wanton woman or a harlot, um, so so Gilead is going to beget this Jephthah. So so there's obviously something here that we have to figure out because Gilead's a good guy, um, but he has this uh, background. Okay, so how do we approach Gilead? Would we say that Gilead is a member of the tribe of Manasseh? Is he, you know, where, where would we look at his origins? Yeah, so, I mean, that's, that, I mean, that's my first thought, that it's probably... The tribe of Manasseh. I mean, he would be. Um, um, 
because he's in the genealogy of Manasseh that you have Gilead, right? Uh, First Chronicles 7, verse 14. The sons of Manasseh, Ashriel, whom she bare, uh, but his concubine, the Aramitess, bare, make her the father of Gilead, right? So, so he would be of the tribe of Manasseh. That's at least okay. I would think. So if he's of the tribe of Manasseh, he is part of Joseph's inheritance. Right. Then we're going to presume that this is coming through Gilead, the area as well, which would be to the east of the Jordan. Would that be a fair statement? Um, yeah, well, yeah, it's definitely east of the Jordan. So Gilead's wife bare him sons, and his wife's sons grew up, and they thrust out Jephthah. Now, what is the Hebrew for thrust out? Um, where is it here? Okay, uh, it means to drive out from a possession, especially okay. uh, expatriate or divorce. So it often means put away in the sense of divorce. Okay, so the sons are recognizing and they're stating that you're not going to inherit in our father's house. You're right. not going to have the double portion. You're not going to have anything else. You are, we, we don't recognize you as a brother. Right, yeah. And and, and some, some versions tra translate it as, um, yeah, cast out. Uh, Jeff. Right. So okay, but that does not inherit. So he doesn't receive an inheritance. That's the idea. So let's drill down a little bit even further in this. Manasseh was seen as being a half tribe. Yeah. Manasseh was seen as being on the fringe, in a manner of speaking of the main church. So is it possible that Gilead represents the movement and that Jephthah is representing those that are continuing, those of us that are continuing to study on July 18th. Okay, so state that again. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to use a different, though similar analogy. What if Gilead of Manasseh represents the movement as a whole? Okay. And what if Jephthah represents those of us that continue to study regarding July 18th? Yeah, well, and have been studying, right? Correct. So they're going to be thrust out. So this is going back on this history, right? So it's going back and giving you this background about who Jephthah is because they're going to they're gonna call for him, right? Correct. They want him to be their captain. Right. So, um, yeah, so it, it would have to do with the message of, of the method of study of what we've been doing since July 18th. That's what Jephthah would be representing. And Gilead would be representing the movement as a whole in, in how it's studying. It, it sees itself as legitimate, uh, but it sees Jephthah as illegitimate. Right. Yeah, that, that's my understanding of what's happening here. Okay. 
So when they when they're saying here, thou shalt not inherit in our father's house, you do not have a place. We don't wish to hear about you. We don't wish to hear what you have to say. You are outside, and that's where you belong. Mm -hmm. For thou you are believing and holding on to things that are different, therefore we fear you. Mm -hmm. Okay, why Isaiah 66.5? Yes, I think it applies here. The Lord says, Hear the word of the Lord, ye that tremble at his word, your brethren that hated you, that cast you out for my name's sake, said, Let the Lord be glorified, but he shall appear to your joy, and they shall be ashamed. Okay, but the reason I'm, I, I asked the question, we were having a, a conversation regarding, I believe, part of Ezekiel. And 665, of course, is one short of the 666. Uh, Isaiah 665. Did I put Ezekiel? What was that? Uh, I, I, it was Isaiah 665. I was wondering if I put Ezekiel instead of Isaiah. No, no, you put Isaiah. You did. Okay, that's <clears throat> No, I'm just I'm going back to the conversation we had this last week about the 665 and 666. Right. In in Isaiah uh, or not in Isaiah, Ezekiel chapter 8 verse 1. Right. So can and, these, and can also these... just to go back to that too. Um so when we looked at Ezekiel, remember we had Ezekiel chapter 8 verse 1. But we also tied that to 11 1, right? So that is, well, to chapter 11, because he's going to be lifted up and brought to the east gate of the Lord's house. And there he's going to see these 25 men. So you're going to see in chapter 8, the 25 men, and in chapter 11, 25 men, two different groups. Um, and 25 can be a symbol between midnight and the midnight cry, amongst other things. But we have 11 1 there as well. So just tying us to this uh, Judges chapter 11. So all three of these symbolically are interrelated. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the 25 can be a symbol of midnight, but can also be a symbol of leadership. Yes. Right. Yeah, it has two different two different references. But I think it's it's powerful when we look at it with both of the symbols together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Now. <clears throat> Judges 11.3, then Jephthah fled from his brethren. Jephthah fled from the face of his brethren and dwelt in the land of Tob. And there were gathered vain men to Jephthah and went out with him. Yeah, so uh, the word there is, well, usually in Hebrew, now you say tov. Um just because they pronounce the la that last letter as a V sound okay. in modern Hebrew. But tov means good. So he goes to the land of good. But he has these vain men that gather around him. So trying to understand what this means. So here he's, he's the son of a harlot or wanton woman. But he's going to be cast out and dwell in the land of good, but around him are going to be gathered vain men, that is, useless men. Okay, and let's look at what the, the verses were that the, the translators had used, because I think that's going to back you up. Mm -hmm. Well, it goes here, Judges 9.4, and they gave him three score and ten pieces of silver out of the house of Baal-bereth, 
wherewith Abimelech hired vain and light persons which followed him. Mm -hmm. And 1 Samuel 22, 2. Interesting number. And everyone that was in distress and everyone that was in debt and everyone that was dented gathered themselves unto him and he became a captain over them and there were with him about 400 men. So if we looked at that, Well, these would be people basically, um, I mean, these are the outcasts, I think is a better way of understanding this. I think that would be a, a wonderful that, way. Uh, Brother um, Dwight, was that, was that referring to, um, um, uh, name was on the top of my head, was that referring to um, Absalom? No, it was, well, it was, it was David at the cave of Abdullam. Okay. So uh, these are the, I thought it was either David or Absalom. I didn't know for sure which one. Now, this is, this is when David had escaped to the cave of Abdullam. So, and being in first Samuel, that would likely have been against Saul. Because this is this is coming after David had gone to the temple and obtained the showbread and and uh, the sword of Goliath. Okay, thank you. I just want to make sure. Sure. So there were gathered outcasts to Jephthah, mm -hmm. and and I think in some ways that. When we look at this story, um, uh, Jephthah being the son of a wanton woman, and he's having these outcasts gathered around him, it's almost from the perspective of his brethren. That is, I mean, obviously Jephthah, we, we couldn't look at this and say that he's, you know, uh, because he's the son of a wanton woman, he's the son of you know, strange wives, and he's got the wrong method of study or something like that. But we can see from their perspective, Jephthah is to be cast out, and the people that gather around him are also outcasts. Right. They're, but it, it's almost from their perspective, from his brethren's perspective. Now, the question was asked regarding um, the verse we read from 1 Samuel 22, 2. Do the 400 men represent 400 years? What I was seeing was that um, the 400 years of the sojourn enslaved and enslaved, that's what I, the number that I equated that with. Okay. Are, are you saying then to the, the years in Egypt? Or, yeah, the, it, 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 Canaan and Egypt, yeah, okay. or from the time that uh, uh, Ishmael mocked Isaac until the Exodus. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, just something that, you know, uh, I keep looking at numbers with from my notes, that's all. Gotcha. Yeah, 400 okay. also mean the fourth generation, too. Um, And that of itself is pretty powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have uh, we have three hundred years mentioned in this chapter in verse twenty six. So we can maybe, if uh, Jephthah was from Manasseh, so was Gideon. Right. And uh, we know we know what Gideon had three hundred men attached to him. So here, here we have another person from Manasseh with 300 years mm -hmm. connected with him. Yeah, and, and you're kind of jumping ahead, but you're going to see that that's going to be significant as you're pointing out here in understanding um, this story. Well, I looked up the meaning of Jephthah's name, and part of it means, means to, to open. So he was a receptive person and to pen. And it's plowing, right? A plow or plowing. 
And I thought William Miller, like plowing, plowing the word, plowing into God's word to receive the fruit of that study. Yeah, so what you're saying about Jephthah's name, he, which it means he opens, um, you're saying that it has to do with plowing as well? Yeah, well, that's what it says in Strong. Anyway. Yeah. It's got a whole slew of meanings. And I figured here's a receptive person who really wants to hear from God and do God's will. Another question I had was, I guess I would have to read, read the spirit of prophecy. Uh, if there's something written about his childhood, but it's funny that the brothers waited till he was a grown man and then they booted him out. I thought, okay, was he like, like Joseph who was persecuted by his brethren from his childhood? Yeah. That's what I'm yeah. curious about. Yeah. So this word patah, um, it's it's a very common word um, in Hebrew um, because often it can refer to um, uh, let me see the the examples here um, but in a in a different form because this is yipatach so this has a a yod in the front of it but I don't know why the dictionary is not giving me the other word. Um, but it can refer to somebody speaking or opening their mouth as well. Um, so, um, yeah, so they have that yipata in front of it. Yipata. Um, I'm going to have to look that up, what the other word is. Just For some reason, it's not, it usually gives you the other word that it's related to. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, Go on. Okay. And it came to pass in the process of time that the children of Ammon made war against Israel. Now, here is Jephthah. His brothers have cast him out. He's living in a good land. He has other outcasts around him. The children of Ammon are making war now against Israel. And it was so that when the children of Ammon made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to fetch Jephthah out of the land of Tov. Why would they then decide? that this message from the East was a reason to go to fetch Jephthah. What does the Hebrew tell us regarding fetching? Well, it just means to take in the widest variety of applications. Um, so this word is used um, um, well the first time um, you know to take also of the tree so it means to basically uh, take hold of something uh, the fruit of the tree it used used there so it's just it's just a why it's a very common word. It's like thousand, well, how many references? Nine hundred and seventy-five times it's used in the King James. <clears throat> well, it's interesting because. when we compare this with other verses that are similar, we would be taken to 1 Samuel 10, 26 and 27. The children of Israel wanted a king. Mm -hmm. And 1 Samuel 10, 26 reads, And Saul also went home to Gibeah, and there went with him a band of men whose hearts God had touched. But the children of Belial said, 
how shall this man save us? And they despised him and brought him no presents, but he held his peace. Here is Jephthah, despised of his brethren. He has a band of outcasts around him. Is it possible that these, the band of outcasts are also those whose hearts God has touched? Mm -hmm. So the elders of Gilead, I would wonder if, if Jephthah's half-brothers were not part of the elders of Gilead, or are this just going to be a separate group altogether? But they decide um, that they have to go fetch Jephthah. I, I think it's a different group, but um, it's hard to say uh, from what we have here. Okay. And they said unto Jephthah, Come and be our captain, that we may fight with the children of Ammon. What is it about this message from the east that makes the elders of Gilead seek an outcast to lead them? Well, it doesn't really tell us, give us much information of why. I mean, other than that he's a mighty man of valor. Well, okay, but my point is the message from the East. In sim symbolically, right now, as we are studying, especially as we are studying about the importance of what we've seen with July 18th. Mm -hmm. There are those within the church and within the other portions of the movement that believe that what we're doing right now is foolishness. They don't want to hear these studies. They don't want to examine the foundations. They don't want to examine chronology. But now this message from the East is going to occur because that's where the children of Ammon have been. So my question is that since this is going to be of the children of the East, it's going to be of what we would call Islam. And all of a sudden, the elders of Gilead are going to want Jephthah. And by implication, those that have been outcast with him, they want to bring him out of the good land. And we are in a good land as we continue our study, as we continue to seek Guidance from the word of the Lord. Because is this not the honey that we need that will enlighten our eyes? Is this not seeking the spirit for his guidance? So these elders and my application here would be these elders of the movement are coming unto Jephthah that we may fight with the children of Ammon, that we may have someone that truly understands the message and can combat this message. Am I too far off base with that? Hmm. 
Okay. Okay, state that again. Okay. The Ammonites represent a message from the East. Okay. And if we're if we are going to track this, the message from the East has something to do with Islam. Uh -huh. The elders of Gilead. have cast out Jephthah, but now this message from the East bothers them. Uh -huh. This message of Islam is causing them great consternation. They don't understand it. And Jephthah is the one that can has the ability to answer that. Correct. So that's why they call him. I mean, I mean, in the story, it doesn't really tell us why particularly they're going to get him. Because you'd think there's, you know, you don't need one person. He's not going to make that much of a difference. Well, so okay. it's kind of an odd story in that way. That they just take this guy, they've cast him out, and now they call upon him for, you know, what reason? I mean, obviously the Ammonites are coming. The children of Ammon are coming against them. Um, but yeah, it's it's just kind of an odd story. But Jephthah has this band of other outcasts with him. Yeah. Well, ain't he a judge? Ain't he a judge? Well, yeah, he's a judge, but he's not a judge yet. I mean, he becomes a judge because they call him and he delivers them from the Ammonites. But prior to that, he's just an outcast with a band of outcasts. And yet when this enemy comes, they're going to call upon him and make him a captain so that they can fight against the Ammonites. And it just seems, it just seems rather odd that they need this person. So, I mean, the story is for us. Okay. So, I'm looking at this symbolically, metaphorically, as being us in the movement, that we are Jephthah, and that the elders of Gilead are other leaders within the movement that are not choosing to examine the foundations and not wanting to address many of the symbols or the chronology as we have been doing over these last many weeks. And Jephthah said unto the elders of Gilead, did ye not hate me and expel me out of my father's house? And why are ye come unto me now when you are in distress? Now here, the translators would have gone to Genesis 26, 27. And Isaac said unto them, Wherefore come ye to me, seeing ye hate me, and have sent me away from you? Who was Isaac talking to at that time? I think it's going to shock you when you really consider this. Okay. Is Isaac not talking to Abimelech? Yeah. So yeah, this is the story dealing with Abimelech, um, which of course is the title, but uh, referring to that, because uh, um, Abraham also ran into an Abimelech. Right. So, okay. So, Abimelech hated Isaac. 
The Abimelech that we were dealing with in Judges is a completely different person, but that Abimelech did not like the straight message either. So Jephthah is saying unto the elders of Gilead, to those that view themselves as being the righteous ones, did ye not hate me and expel me out of my father's house? So the elders of Gilead at least have some kind of a relationship with Jephthah's brothers, if they are not Jephthah's brothers. Because here he's, he's basically saying to them, just as he would to his brothers, did you not hate me and expel me out of my father's house? And he comes to them with a fair question. Why are ye come unto me now when ye are in distress? What do you want from me? You didn't want me as part of the family. You didn't want me in the movement. Why are you coming to me now? What else do you see here? Is there a different way of looking at this that I'm not considering? Okay, now the comment from the chat is that Isaac had not been straight with Abimelech, having lied about Rebekah. So the comment is that Isaac had not been honest with Abimelech. Would that be a correct statement? I mean, at this, at this point, when Isaac went before Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, <clears throat> it was when there was a famine. Mm -hmm. And Isaac was told not to go to Egypt. Right. I thought it was because of a whale, wasn't it? Wasn't it over the whales? Did abandon whales? The, the whales. Yeah, whales. You're talking. Yeah, about. the whales. It um, they was um, they was filling up, and uh, Isaac went back to um, undig them. Every time he dig one, they would fill it up. And the Benlet came to him. Is that what that's what we're talking about? You're correct. Because that occurs back in uh, Genesis 26, 14, and 15. Yeah. So the battle that we're talking about here has less to do with Rebecca, but quite a bit to do with the wells. Yeah. And um, so we're going to have Beersheba, the well of the oath, in connection with these stories. Right. So if we have the well of the oath, we also have the seven times. Yeah. So in this situation with the elders of Gilead, this message that comes from Islam bothers them enough because not only are they not studying the foundations they do not wish to have anything to do with the seven times because they've set it aside well and, and not necessarily completely um see part of the problem that i see when you reject the chronology message of chronology that god's given this movement you're undermining the seven times Exactly. And, and you may not think that you're doing it. You may think that, um, that you accept, you know, what's on the chart. But, you know, one of the things that, that we were shown as, we, as this movement progressed in its understanding of the 2520 is that Miller's understanding was only partial. 
and that God gave an increase of light to this movement regarding the 2520. One is specifically that there's two 2520s, and there are many, many groups that accept Miller's 2520, not talking about our movement, but people outside of our movement, but don't accept Hiram Metzen's 2520, and, and don't accept, accept the combination of the two. Also, they don't accept the, the symbolic nature. Uh, they don't accept the four seven times and the 220 years and the 490 years. Right? They don't see that as significant in any way. So the 220 being connected to this period, because when you look at the whole thing, it's all about literal Israel and then uh, how the 70 weeks gives this transition to spiritual Israel. So, so people can profess to believe something, but actually reject, reject it at the same time. <coughs> you can see this with July 18th. People can say they accept July 18th, but if you accept all of the, the arguments that led you to July 18th, if you rejected you know, the symbolic use of numbers and all these different things, how can you even talk about July 18th? You have no foundation to stand upon. So once you look at it, you would have to reject July 18th. So we have the same situation here. Okay. Now, <clears throat> and the elders of Gilead said unto Jephthah, And this is, this is no, no different than what was being said in Judges 10.18. And the people and the princes of Gilead said unto one another, What man is he that will begin to fight against the children of Ammon? He shall be head over the inhabitants of Gilead. And that's the verse that you were addressing at the very outset of this meeting. Mm -hmm. And the elders of Gilead said unto Jephthah, Therefore we turn again to thee now, that thou mayest go with us and fight against the children of Ammon, and be our head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. Yeah. You know, so it, I find it funny, um, because, you know, I, I look obviously at these commentaries, I got them here because they sometimes give, give good references, but sometimes they're way off base. And when it comes to, um, I can't remember which comment, I think it's Albert Barnes, but, uh, um, you know, he says that chapter 11 is out of place, that it's not connected to tap chapter 10, verse 17 and 18. And, and I just marvel that he anybody could make that claim. Yeah, that's going to be Albert Barnes. Um, yeah, he says with you know this is a, a Ammonite war without any apparent reference to Judges ten verse seventeen to eighteen, and it's so obvious that that's what it is. That that you know how does that happen? That something that's just right there, that you can clearly see that chapter eleven is just going back and reiterating that history of of Jephthah to give you this this connection is actually doing this so that you can understand who this one is that's going to be headed over the, all the inhabitants of Gilead. Uh, it, it, you see, you see the problem that, that without the Holy Spirit to teach us, we can get things quite wrong. Very quickly. Yeah. I without, agree. Yeah. Now, just another point that um, I, I'm kind of talking a bit here, but so the name Jephthah, um, I looked at the gematria of it, and when you have the combined gematria, that is, uh, the reverse gematria and um, the, the regular gematria, it adds up to 216. That is, it's 76 and 140. Um, so the forward one, 76, the reverse is 140. And now 216, just a, a, something that... Um, I never had looked at before, but I looked at the Hebrew of the name Palmoni. That is, if you use the Hebrew version of Palmoni, um, 
it adds up to 216 as well. And the question is, why does the name Palmini add up to 216? Because we recognize 216 is 6 times 6 times 6. <coughs> okay. Um, but in, in this movement, when we look at 216, it's representing a message regarding the Sunday law. All right, intriguing. Right. So, so that that just that note about Jephthah, his his name. Now, of course, that's combined gematria. So it, um, you know, some people don't take that as valid, adding the two together. But we've done it other places and other times. Um, but it ties us to this symbol of the Sunday law. But it also ties us to the importance of chronology. Yeah, Palmini as well. The I'm going to show my ignorance. Um, show my ignorance. What is what is um, uh, what what was that you just said, Theodore, about the um, gematria? Gematria, yeah. Gematria. Is, gematria, yeah. What is that? Gematria, not gematria. Gematria, yeah. Gematria. So it is um, taking the letters in a name okay. and assigning to them a number. Okay, and, I know what you're talking about now. Yeah, so we can add them together. We can also multiply them. So like Lamech, for instance, if you take the English Lamech and you right. multiply the value for those letters at, in their place in our alphabet, A would be, you know, L would be whatever it is. Uh, yeah, I understand that. I uh, just didn't know. I didn't, re I didn't recognize the word. Is what you, yeah. The word you um, use. Yeah. Yeah, so we've used it a lot. Yeah, it's just, uh, it's, yeah. So anyway, that's uh, the, the interesting part about Jephthah is this connection to the Sunday law um, symbolism. Okay. And Jephthah said unto the elders of Gilead, if ye bring me home again to fight against the children of Ammon, and the Lord deliver them before me, shall I be your head? Mm -hmm. So Jephthah is asking them a, a, a blunt question. Are you going to accept this method of study if the Lord delivers you from the Ammonites, from this message of the East. And the elders of Gilead said unto Jephthah, the Lord be the hearer between us, be the witness between us, if we do not so according to thy words. So, are they saying that they're going to accept this message based upon chronology, based upon studying the foundations that they have heretofore rejected? Yeah, that's what it appears. Now, it's, it's just kind of an interesting exchange. So, first in verse 6, they say, come be our captain, right? Right. Um, so they want him to to lead out in this war against, um, you know, so they want him to be a leader. That is uh, the word captain. Katsin means in the sense of determining a magistrate as deciding or other leader, captain, guide, prince, ruler, etc. Um, so first they ask him to be their captain. And then he says, well, why? You, you've, you've cast me out. You've Why rejected you me. me now? Yeah, you've rejected me. You've expelled me. You've driven me out. So, so why are you coming to me now? And, and then they say um, uh, that they, you know, if you come and fight with us, you will be our head. So it's more than a captain, right? 
So it's progressing. You know, we'll be a captain. We can lead our army. But, you know, you can actually be the head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. And then he really asked them, are you serious? That's the way that I would take it. And do you mean what you say? Yeah, do you mean what you say? And and he's saying, so you're saying if if you bring me home again to fight against the children of Ammon and the Lord deliver them before me, shall I be your head? And it's also not just now, but in the future. You're, you're make, basically making me your leader. And they say, yeah, God be a witness between us if we do not so according to thy words. So... So it, it just happens in, I mean, they have this little bit of reluctance, but for some reason they really know that he's the one that's going to be able to deliver them. And, and I, I just find it kind of a remarkable story. Yeah, well, in the first verse it, it introduces him as a mighty man of valor. So he was already known for being a good, good soldier, I guess, or being upright. Yeah, but, you know, there should be other good soldiers, too. I mean, but, you know, they see him, obviously, as the best choice, even though they've cast him out. So they, so they recognize his value in some sense, but they feel that they can do without him. But at this point, they can't. At least feel that they can't, so... <clears throat> okay but at this point as well the elders are placing this that they want god is their witness between them that if we don't do what we're saying then we are placing ourselves in god's hands for judgment because if we look at this, we would have Jeremiah 42.5 that the translators had relied on. Then they said to Jeremiah, the Lord be a true and faithful witness between us. If we do not even according to all things for which the Lord thy God shall send thee to us. <clears throat> so. There's quite a bit here. The elders are now admitting that they were wrong in casting Jephthah out, that they need him, they need his skill, they need his message in order to defeat the message from the East. Now we have a doubling coming up. <clears throat> Judges 11.11. 11. Then Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and captain over them. Head and captain. Mm -hmm. And Jephthah uttered all his words before the Lord in Mitzpah. Again, Mitzpah is brought back up. Uh -huh. For is this not the city in which they would anoint the kings? So the elders and the people have made him head and captain. Okay, so you're talking about here mitzpah as being where they anoint the king? <clears throat> I'm asking the question. No, this is the mitzpah in uh, um, Gilead. Okay. Different place. Different place. Okay. Yeah, this is the place that's north of the Jabbok and where Laban's cairn it, is located. So the his uh, memorial. But the word mitzvah means watchtower, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's a watchtower. And, and, and that's because Laban makes this Karen and he says, let this, you know, watch between me and you. Um, dealing with May this watch between me and thee as we are absent one from another. Yeah. 
So that's why it's a watchtower or a heap. Okay, so here we have this situation. We have the elders of Gilead and the people are now making Jephthah head and captain. So it's not just leadership. It's the entire group. They are choosing Jephthah to be head and captain. So would we say in this way that this entire group is ceding civil and religious authority to Jephthah? Um, well, captain is just a general of the army. Um, I don't see any religious authority. Okay. Um, so he's going to be their leader. You know, All right. The ruler. And, and he's also going to be the general of the army. Okay. Sort of like the president of the United States. He's both general and head of the state, United States. Yeah. Yeah. That same way. Okay, now the translators here would have used Judges 11.8, which we have just addressed. But they also go back to Judges 10.17, Judges 20, verse 1, and then a, select, a couple of selections from 1 Samuel. So as we look at this regarding the words before the Lord in Mitzvah, <clears throat> Then the children of Ammon were gathered together and encamped in Gilead, and the children of Israel assembled themselves together and encamped in Mitzpah. Okay, um, I just want to go back to the comment made by William there. Sure. Wouldn't this be kind of an irony with the failure of the Trump prediction that this message is made head and captain, just like yes. the president of the United States? Right. I mean, you don't need me to agree with you on that. But <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's an interesting sort of um, uh, point. Well, because we have this prediction when it will fail, because um, they're looking for Trump, they're looking for him to be president. But now um, they have to go back and take up this message, making it head and captain. Um, so it's, it's, it's just a very interesting point. Sorry about interrupting here. Uh, but you're not. I mean, the, the point is, and I think you, you need to expand on this just a little bit. Right now, the majority of the movement sees the re-election of Trump to be the, the key point that the movement is supposed to be promulgating. Mm -hmm. But we're also having a bit of blinders that many of those have had because we're at a point right now where in the next two years and 80 odd days, any number of things could happen. Currently, we see what amounts to a version of elder abuse going on before us because the current president is really not the one that's in charge of anything. Mm -hmm. He is in all intents and purposes a figurehead. Elder Jeff was very clear in many of the things that he addressed regarding the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And if anybody has a question regarding what I am saying, I would recommend to you heartily to go back and view Daniel's last vision 
<clears throat> Studies number 10 and 11. Because just as, as we have looked at how this situation with Trump is not the message for this time, Elder Jeff was being very clear at that time that there is a lot of poison that is being presented, whether you are watching CNN, whether you're watching Fox, or if, God forbid, you're choosing the Eternal World Television Network. <clears throat> Each of these have been manners in which false messages have been being presented. So, <clears throat> and Jephthah sent messengers unto the king of the children of Ammon, saying, what hast thou to do with me that thou art come against me to fight in my land? So this message from the east is Jephthah also recognizing that the children of Ammon have made the decision to bring the battle to the doorstep of the elders of Gilead. In the past, we have looked at this false prophet that saddled his ass to curse the children of Israel. The ass first turned out of the way into the field. Then as they were going down <clears throat> between the walls of the vineyards, the ass crushes the prophet's foot. <clears throat> and then at last, the ass falls down before the angel of the Lord that has a drawn sword. All of these situations are the combination of this false prophet with Islam, with the ass. Now, here, what hast thou to do with me, that thou art come against me to fight in my land? We have three symbols the turning out into the field, the crushing of the foot, and then the ass falls down. Is this representational of that third symbol where the ass falls down? Can you expand on that a bit? Okay. <clears throat> In this situation that we're addressing. Yeah. The false prophet has basically three events that take place before the angel of the Lord or Christ is standing before them and before the ass with his sword drawn. Yeah, so we know we have we, the three strikes of Islam we, we speak of. Correct. 
I'm asking if this situation where Islam brings the battle to the doorstep of the elders of Gilead, is this another representation of the third strike of Islam? Okay, so in chapter 10, um, the children of Ammon are actually going to come against, uh, they're going to cross over the Jordan. Right. That's first what happens. They're going to oppress them. And, um, and that's what is entitled the further disobedience and oppression. Right. And, and then they're going to repent, right? So that is, we're going to see this happening uh, with, um, because they come against Ephraim and Judah and Benjamin, right? So these ones are, are going to repent. So, so if we're going to have that as, as some event dealing with Islam, uh, it's not exactly the same event that we have starting in verse 17 of chapter 10, when they're ca- encamped against in, in Gilead, right? And encamped in Mizpah, right? So this is different, even though these are the children of Ammon, um, and, it, and it's basically at the same time. First, they come against Judah, Benjamin, and Ephraim, and then they're just going. And then they're going once they're um, um, it doesn't really say exactly the, the, how they're delivered them, right? It doesn't say anything about what happens. He just says to put away your strange gods. So this is a call to repentance that occurs. But now in verse 17 and 18, we see that they're going to be in Gilead the children of Ammon, and that's when Jephthah comes and delivers them. So so we have basically these two different encounters in this story, uh, the children of of Ammon. So if, if, if that's the case, could we say that the first one really relates to 9-11 and that this is the second one? I'm wondering, I mean, is 9-11 the crushing of the foot with this being the third? We're in the same pattern. I'm just trying to to come to a a, a clearer understanding of what I'm seeing. Okay, so the order of of Balaam is... Turning Turning into a field. Okay. Crushing the foot, yeah, and then coming before the angel of the Lord with his sword sword drawn. Right. So, so where have we placed nine eleven in the past with those three? Hasn't it been with the turning away into the field? I'm not disagreeing that that's where we placed it in the past, <clears throat> but. Didn't 9-11 also have an economic impact? World Trade Center. Right. I mean, the reason I'm asking the question the way I am is in my business, after 9-11, 40% of my client base shut down and they didn't return. So I saw first and foremost, a huge economic impact because when you shut down in an area like this, you shut down 40% of your overall restaurants, you're shutting down a huge number. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just that um, because it was done with uh, aircraft, uh, my business shut down too for many months. Um, which is the aircraft industry. Right. It, it took a lot of people out. We went into bankruptcy, the company that I was with at the time, uh, shortly thereafter. So, yeah. Um, it was a big financial um, hit. And that, and that was, uh, from what I can tell from reading some of the stuff from the claims from 
Islamic uh, extremist. Uh, the target was to get at the world's financial system mm. and the, and what he, they called the uh, beast or dragon, which is the United States to them. Right. Um, so, I mean, we probably need to look at this story of Balaam a bit more in detail tomorrow. Mm. Okay. Uh, just to make sure we got it clear on what what's happening um because i mean if this is the children of east and we're going to take it as one of those strikes um we would have to i mean maybe maybe chapter 10 is the second strike mm -hmm. uh, being and if it's the second strike where would we place that is that 9 11. all right you know that's that that's the question okay so now we need to prepare on this on the on the study of balaam and look at this then tomorrow mm -hmm. okay our time for today is about up are there any other thoughts or questions regarding what we've been addressing Any other comments? Shall we then close with prayer? <clears throat> Gracious Father, we thank you <clears throat> for this time that we have spent together. We thank you for the opportunity to study with like-minded believers because iron does sharpen iron. Be with us now as we go through the rest of this day. Help us and prepare us for that that you would have us to do. For may your character be glorified in all that we do. Be with us now. Direct us. Help us. That we may learn so that we may walk in the path that you would set before us. For this, we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.